right, welcome to another Thursday morning and yet another episode of Seeds of Music. I'm your host, Kyle Williams, and this is the number one web show and podcast where aspiring independent artists and do-it-yourself musicians can learn right now how to gain wider exposure, grow a strong base of raving fans, and make a living doing what they love. Okay, on the show today, we have Mallory Zumbach, who is the SR Director of Creative for Round Hill Music, and Round Hill Music is a music licensing company. Company. Now, Mallory has worked with York, uh, studied at Berkeley. Uh, she's worked with Gershwin catalogs. If you don't know who uh, George Gershwin is, an old school uh, jazz, uh, during the jazz era, era is a famous, famous writer. Uh, and also video game placements, such as uh, the game Bioshock, for any of you video game nerds out there, uh, which includes me, of course. I'm not hating on that. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to get your songs licensed the right way, which includes how much can an artist make from music? Music licensing. What kind of genres can exactly license music? Are there certain genres that tend to do better? Or is there one particular genre that is just the most successful that you just have to be in? Uh, and what would a musician need to have in place before they even think about licensing their songs? So let's jump right in. All right, Mallory, thanks for coming on the Seeds Music Show. I know that... Um... I know that we might have a little bit of background noise because you got like a kitchen nearby and some thin glass windows, but it sounds like your office is is much more swanky than mine because I have thick, <laughs> I have thick, ugly uh, plaster walls, <laughs> not as appealing, but but somewhat soundproof. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a, a very cool office, and it definitely encourages a lot of sort of creative uh, chatter amongst everybody. Uh, I think having those thin glass, yeah. glass doors <laughs> helps, um, but it can be a little bit of an echo chamber. Yeah, for plus sure. you can see who's working and who's not because you just have to- Yes. Like <laughs> yeah, just like, <laughs> you see that they're playing Farmville or whatever on their, on their computer screen. Their that board. is very true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's cool. Well, um, just uh, uh, real quick, I just wanna, um, before we hit up this you know, subject, because we're gonna be talking specifically about music licensing and how artists, uh, independent artists can take action right now to start making income from that. Uh, I just want to go over a little bit about like who you are and what you do. I, I know that um, when I was looking, when we were talking through email, you had an email signature, you just got promoted to the senior director of, of, of creative. I mean, what, what exactly, I know that you work with a music licensing uh, company, Round Home Music, but what, what exactly do you do within it? Well, we're a sort of full-service music publisher, and we're actually also starting a label arm, believe it or not. Um, but what the reason, I guess, that my title involves the term creative as opposed to uh, sync specifically is just that because we're a smaller company, uh, people's jobs encompass a lot of things. So, um, you know, not only do I get to work on sync licensing and I specifically specialize in pitching songs for use in advertisements and video games and then also uh, film and TV along with our two other sync people. I'm going to nerd out on the video game thing in a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize one of the games. I play, I play games. I, if, in case everyone knows, I play a lot of, a lot of video games. <laughs> Not too much though. I have the stuff you do. But you've actually worked with, uh, um, I, you know, I was reading, reading through like your bio. You've worked mm -hmm. with Bjork before. What was, I mean, what was that like? Um, that was actually at my very first job um, at a small independent label called One Little Indian Records. Um, they are a UK-based company uh, founded by a guy named Derek Burkett, who um, as a teenager was actually in a punk band that toured with Bjork. So she was one of his first sort of signings. Um, and in the States, uh, we basically got all of her sort of more obscure releases because she had a deal with a bigger major label here for her mainline releases. But when I was there, we released um, the soundtrack to Drawing Restraint 9, which was this film that she did with her um, partner, Matthew Barney, who's like an avant-garde artist. And um, it was it was cool. If you're someone like me, I'm a huge York fan. So I oh, wow. love the weird, the weird stuff that she does. And for that to be my first job to get to work with that record was was really interesting. Um, it was sort of a piece that they did about whaling, and so she used a lot of these traditional Japanese instruments in it, and it was, I mean, just very Bjork. Like, everything that she does, she innovates. Um, so it was really cool to work with her music. Um, you know, she didn't necessarily license a lot, but we did get to do a few different things. I remember somebody 
um, a student who wanted to do like a ballet dance performance set to one of her pieces. That was one of the things that we worked on. So you never know, you know, um, what, what you're going to use Bjork for. But that was a really cool experience for me because I definitely am a huge fan. So. Yeah, but it seems like you did fi find different ways to, to you know, uh, monetize her music, you know, to find other people who wanted to use it for whatever reason. It's like you probably don't have to have very eclectic, you know, music like Bjork. You just have to have an open mind to be seeking those opportunities. Uh, but I know, that, I know that you next, uh, you after that, you know, or sometime along the way, you started to work for Warner Chapel, uh, the music mm -hmm. publishing uh, strategic marketing department, I think it mm -hmm. was. Uh, like that's Warner Chapel is a huge. So how was I mean, how was it? What did you learn? Um, what are some key things that you learned when you moved into there to start working? Um, well, when I moved over to Warner Chapel to be inside a whole department as opposed to just kind of being the one person who, who did my job when I was at the small indie label, um, I feel like one of the biggest things that I benefited from was just the knowledge of the other people in my department and my, my boss and my coworkers um, who had been doing sync for a long time. And, um, you know, at the indie label where you had to kind of do a little bit of everything, I felt like I got this really great broad knowledge of things, but to then move to a place that had a full staffed department of people just focusing on advertising and video game music yeah. it was it was like the best possible way to go super in depth yeah you know um so and i think you license music to bioshock that's yes. what i was gonna nerd about because he because you were you were working with catalogs um like the gershwin catalog so that makes sense because bioshock had all that old like 30s and 40s mu music in it um but that's that's awesome that you have like such a such like a wide wide range um of, of experience with that. I mean, how, how exactly how much can an artist make from music licensing? Um, it varies amazingly, kind of depending on a lot of factors. Um, you know, a younger, lesser well-known artist isn't going to necessarily command the fees that um, somebody like a Bjork would or a George Gershwin or Cole Porter. Um, yeah. You know, um, but by that same token, you can make a lot of money over time with a lot of small fee uses. Um, you know, and the pricing also differs depending on what the use is for. So getting your song used as an indie artist, getting your song used in a TV show might equate to a couple of thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. But getting that same song used in an advertisement might end up making you twenty or thirty thousand yeah. um, dollars. Over how depending on the advertisement. You over know? how long of a period of time are we talking? Um, for an ad, uh, that's like a year long use for okay. for kind of an unknown indie band might okay. be in that range. Okay. Um, you know, and it also just depends. Some clients have more, they have a bigger budget. So, yeah. you know, you could stand to make more if, if you're landing a spot um, for a client who traditionally has larger music budgets set aside versus um, ones that don't. You know, just like an indie movie yeah. doesn't pay as well as a large studio release. Yeah. Um, you know, but so there are, there are a lot of factors. I will say that being at a publisher, um, you know, one of our jobs is to negotiate those fees on behalf of our writers, okay. and um, and that's one of the things where I think, you know, our position really comes into play because a lot of young bands who have never had anything licensed before are quick to jump at a use just to make, you know, five hundred dollars yeah. putting it into their friend's film, or yeah. um, they might even think that they should just give the song away for free. Um, and we are kind of there to step in and try to help make sure that they actually get paid a fair amount, you know, and that they are getting their music placed in the right uses okay. where maybe you're not making as big of a feed, but the exposure will be worth it or, you know what I mean? We yeah. can kind of help better judge that just from our experience. So, um, so, so that's definitely, definitely get help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think get so. help. Get help. If you're think, uh, they can, uh, do you think every artist should think about life, at least think about, consider licensing music? Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean... When I was at Warner Chapel, we had bands who certainly didn't need to. Radiohead doesn't need to license their music, oh, you know, yeah. and yeah. Um, they never really were into advertising, but they were at a point in their career where I don't think it mattered as much. Um, but these days, I think if you're, you know, a newer current artist, um, you definitely really have to consider it because 
there are just so many bands out there. There's so much noise and to stand out from the crowd, um, you know, I feel like licensing can be really um, helpful. It can be a really helpful factor. And plus it can help make you money. You know, sales aren't what they used to be. Um, you know, we do smaller deals with these younger bands where if they land one or two advertisements, then they've recouped their advance. So, you know, I think it's really important to be open to that, um, but also to work with somebody who's not going to steer your music into something that it shouldn't be used. Yeah, be, yeah. You know, I mean, how do you balance the artistic integrity with, uh, you know, the music music licensing? Because I know, whenever uh, for some artists, when you start talking money, uh, they want to make more money, but they're also it also makes them uncomfortable. Sure, um, I think we we are lucky to be a new company where you know, um, we've only been around for a few years and so when we start talking to a writer about signing them, we are able to have the conversation up front of like what makes you uncomfortable in, in licensing, you know, what are things you would prefer not to do versus what are you open to. Um, at a bigger company like oh, Warner Chapel or Sony, like some of those deals are 20 years old so they don't really have that luxury. They kind of have to, if, if the writer's really picky, they just have to deal with it in the moment. Um, but for us, I think, you know, we specifically look to work with people who are open to licensing. But we also talk to people in advance um, so that we know not to pitch their music for a certain, you know, product that they don't like. If they're really into protecting the environment, then, then we're not going to be pitching it for like a gas goes Monsanto, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know what if I mean? you don't like GMOs, you're not going to be hitting up Monsanto for... No, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and so I think that that's really important because we don't want to send something out and have a client fall in love with it and then not be able to use it. Um, and, but we also don't want to be putting pressure on our artists yeah. to use, to use a song in a way that they feel completely goes against their own like morals. You yeah, know? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so I think that's definitely something that we try to have conversations about early and often. Yeah. What are the, what are some other common objections that you get from artists who are considering music licensing besides like, Hey, don't, don't use my uh, uh, song, uh, song in an article in a ad about killing baby seals. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, another really common thing that comes up, um, actually, to go back to Bioshock is a good example. That was one of the first games that I worked on, and when I was doing a lot of the clearance, where I would be reaching out, you know, they knew what songs of ours they wanted to use at that point, and I would be reaching out to the managers um, or the lawyers. In that case. It was a video game that was using a lot of older, standard era music. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the people representing the estates of those writers had never gotten a video game request had before. Had never heard of it before in their life. They're like, what's this video yeah. game? <laughs> and we definitely got a few people who were very concerned about the fact that there was violence in it. You know, um, I remember one representative in particular um, turning us down and then she talked to her granddaughter about it and changed her mind because her granddaughter was like, no, I've been hearing really good things about this game. And, you know, it's not humans. It's not human on human violence. It's human on like monster violence. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so, yeah, but it totally she, is though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is, it is, but it's you know, like we, mutated humans kind of. Yeah, thing. but, but yeah, we definitely like had to, you know, do some convincing and, um, we thought for sure that a couple of the songs that were from that particular catalog that did end up being in the game um, weren't going to get approved because she was really nervous and concerned about the fact that it was a, a you know a first person shooter. So yeah, um, yeah. so that's definitely something that comes up is, is violence. You know I know that um, for all of the artists that really want to have their music in Grand Theft Auto, there are always a few that are wary um, yeah, because. Yeah. You know, it's it's a violent game, and then um, I think sometimes that can come up in in the movie, the movie world as well. You know, um, some people are uncomfortable with their music being set behind a sex scene, or yeah. you know, they might put into their agreement that they don't really want um, they don't really want the song used in anything that's you know got an X rating versus an R rating, or so there's. There is some sensitivity um, to stuff like that, um, but I mean, it really depends. Some people don't care at all, you know. Yeah. So, some people are all about <laughs> sex, drugs, rock and roll, and so that's yeah. fine with them, you know. Um, it's just those are all things we have to really make sure that our writers are open with us about and that we discuss with them. Okay, but they're all like stipulated beforehand, like in that contract. 
a lot of them are. For us, we're lucky because all of our deals are new deals, so we've been able to stipulate that. Okay. Um, for um, for a company that has a lot of really old catalog where the deals were done years and years ago, that's not necessarily the case. And then you do kind of have to go each time and get their approval and run things by them. So, so it really depends. Okay. And, and what uh, kind of genres can license music? I mean, can all genres license music, like Russian polka all the way to like <laughs> rock? I mean, is there, is there one particular genre that you find is, is the most successful or does, is there an even chance for any, any genre? Um, it's, it's definitely not even, you know, it, it depends on the project, but I would say right now, especially in advertising, we get so many requests for new indie music, you know, indie right. rock, indie pop, it needs to be a beat and catchy and make you feel good. Like, like that's like the Lumineers, basically like the Lumineers, yeah. or we have a band here called American authors that have a song called best day of my life. Yeah. You know, um, and it's it makes you feel Try good. Crestor for five days for free. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was used in um, a Lowe's ad right before we signed them, and it's been used in a bunch of movie trailers and like TV show promos okay. and stuff because it's just it's a big upbeat, infinite happy song, you know. Okay. And so I think that's definitely a sound. Um, variations of that sound are, are not going to go away anytime soon, especially in advertising where you really typically need feel good music. You know, I think also singer songwriter, pretty singer songwriter music, that's always going to be used in, you know, indie films or yeah. in certain TV shows. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, lyrics are another thing that's very important too. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to to the genre, but definitely right now, indie, indie rock is is a pretty safe bet. So a little bit harder to license mm -hmm. Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not I even mean, gonna go into the lyrics there. But, yeah, uh, no. lyrics boy. can be problematic, and but even the fact gotta... <laughs> that he's so heavy, you know, there yeah. there's there might be a specific use for that. Oh, there yeah. may be a specific movie. There, that's you know, no music is completely the first unlicensed. Ace Ventura. But... The first Ace Ventura, well, they had an appearance <laughs> yeah. and a performance, so it was like a performance. Voice. Yeah. You know, where yeah, Jack Harris jumps on stage and he's like, oh. He just exactly. Like, <laughs> totally. Yeah. That is a great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Don't, yeah. 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 Don't, 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 don't give it, don't, well, the bottom line is like, if, let's say that someone, you know, they're not like, you know, indie pop uh, genre, I'm sure mm -hmm. plenty of artists are, don't consider them in that, in, in that, mm -hmm. in that way, but uh, it, you know, the purpose of the a music licensing company is to help you find uh, those opportunities. So uh, just don't, my advice to anyone would be to not pass that up. Would you, would you have the same kind of advice? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, um, to be open to stuff, to have, to realistic expectations, you know, if your sound is something that is a little bit more out there, um, to know that you're not going to necessarily get as many opportunities as an American authors or a luminaires, but um, you know, that being the case, when an opportunity comes your way, then yeah. you really need to, to consider it because yeah. that may be the only request you're getting this year, yeah. you know? Yeah. And the, and, the, and the music licensing, uh, should be only just one piece of your, of your business strategy as a, as an independent artist. And you should have a business strategy if you don't. Oh, for sure. It's like, but it's, it's just one, it's one way, it's one income stream that you can, and you can set up now. Like what, what would a musician need to have in place before they even think about licensing? Um, for me, we always make sure that our writers have at least two versions of every song, the, the normal version oh, and then okay. the instrumental version. Okay. Um, and you need to be ready to supply those at a moment's notice because you never know if somebody's going to want to have to like edit um, edit things. So I think that's that's really key. Be prepared with your audio when you're in the studio recording stuff. Think about the fact that you need to have the instrumentals too, because um, it's so much harder to go back and create them later. Um, oh, okay. We've encountered that with artists before. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I think you for us it helps for the material to be released on the one hand because then people know oh if i'm going to use this in my tv show i'm 
I'm going to be able to turn around and steer people straight to the iTunes or whatever so they know that it's a legitimate song. Mm -hmm. But also, the sooner that you can get it to people um, before it's released helps. Um, because there are certain games, you know, a lot of the EA Sports games, for example, um, or a lot of movies where they need to decide on the music months in advance and they might want something that's not really releasing until the time that the game or the movie or whatever is coming out. Oh, so, right. um, you know, I think like if you're a band and you're assigned to a publisher um, or you're working with a company that represents bands for sync then you really need to make sure that you get that audio to people with all the correct information um, you know we need to know if there's a writer on it that's not a writer that we represent that's represented by another publisher um, we need all that information yeah. Yeah. that has to be cleared up and settled we can't pitch something that has a sample on it unless the sample is free and clear and you yeah, know how much yeah. the song is the you know the sample counts for um so you really have to have your your ducks in a row on on that side um i think you know if you really want to be prepared to license to license stuff um and then i think also you know again part of preparing yourself is being open minded is paying attention to what's being used yeah, currently yeah, yeah. um you know, we tell when a lot of our writers come to us and they're like, oh, we want to write more sync friendly stuff. Like, how do we do that? We tell them, um, you know, we'll send them examples of stuff. Like, here's a band that keeps coming up as a reference to be, you know, replaced or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe listen to some of their music and maybe here's a commercial that used one of their songs so you can see, like, what it is about the song that fit for that commercial. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I don't want to say do your homework, but you kind of have to do your homework. If you've never watched TV before, how can you really know yeah. which one of your songs stands out? And we like for our writers to come to us and say, you know, here's 10 new songs, and I think definitely pay attention to these two because to yeah. us, they're the most sync friendly, and then we can kind of have a dialogue about it, yeah. you know, and confirm that or say, actually, we like this one even better, and, yeah. you know, here's why. And that's yeah. kind of how you learn, that's how you learn about what works and what doesn't. Yeah. So. You could probably, uh, uh, what about jingles, you know, just like really short segments? Because what popped into my head was uh, maybe that, you know, there's certain like tech startups that have online platforms that um, when they run commercials about their product, they want to have music in the background. Uh, the first example that popped into my mind is was you when you listen to Spotify's free version and they run ads mm -hmm. and that, that jingle that's running in the background. I mean, they, I'm sure someone at Spotify didn't make that. They probably had to how to get that license. So um, is there, what about opportunities for, for stuff like that? There are definitely opportunities out there. Um, there are companies that exist to be original music houses and to, to create that music and that's like their whole thing that they do. But we also find sometimes that music supervisors want for a band, a real band, you know, who exists as a band, tours as a band, um, to create something new too. Um, okay. You know, and so that's another conversation that we have with writers right away when, we, when we're even talking about signing them is, is this something that you want to do? Do you want to write, we call it writing to spec. Because mm -hmm. you're given, you know, you're, yeah. here are the specifications and, and yeah. can you turn out something that fits in that mold but maybe still has your band sound or whatever. And so um, I think that's something else that we definitely discuss. And to be ready to do that, you really have to have some sort of home studio set up so that you can turn out stuff that sounds good and yeah. you can turn it out quickly. Yeah. Not everybody can do that. You know, sometimes we get searches for advertisements and they're due the same day. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. you know, you so we need day. to know. <laughs> exactly. Like, we need to know, are you, if, you know, if you are somebody who's open to this, let us know when you're out on the road touring because then we know that maybe that's not the right opportunity for you to write for because you don't have time. But um, if you're around and you can turn something out quickly, um, I mean, that's something that's really key. It has to sound good, yeah. but you also have to be able to do it, you know, um, pretty, pretty quickly. So yeah. Um, yeah. that's so, but, an important thing to be realistic about. Yeah. Creative ability, ability to make something that sounds well, but also being able to work with the logistics of it, but you know, that's the logistics is what you guys handle and you make it, I'm sure you make it possible, you know, cause without, without like a, a company like yours doing that, it's, it's just not possible. So, um, let's say that, uh, I'm an independent artist and I have all of my, uh, all my ducks in a row for, uh, what I need to have in place to, to reach out to Roundhill mm -hmm. music. Uh, can you just like walk me through step by step about like 
what I would, what's the first step I would need to take and what would happen after that? Um, well, ideally you, you would know somebody who could push your music through to us. Um, because like most companies, we don't really take just blind random submissions. Okay. So you would need to have, you know, um, a manager or a lawyer, and they don't even have to necessarily be your manager or a lawyer, but somebody that you know works in the industry that thinks that your sound is good and, and is willing to say, okay. gotcha. guys, you should check this out. You know what I mean? Um, and, and then we would want as much information on the band as possible. We really like to try to see um, a band or an artist live. Um, if we can, I mean, obviously not everybody is coming through New York at the right convenient time for that, but we try to make sure that, you know, we see somebody or someone in our Nashville or LA offices actually gets to check out, um, okay. you know, a show. And we personally really like to actually meet with the writer, not just their manager or lawyer. Okay. Um, because we really want to talk to the writer, um, and kind of find out what they're looking for. You know, and yeah. that's one of the ways I feel like, you know, if somebody's the right fit for you, um, we really kind of pride ourselves on the fact that we have a lot of direct connectivity to our writers and artists. Um, you know, and so if you, if you got to that point where you were coming in to meet with us, then hopefully you've already kind of thought about yep. things like where you stand on sync and licensing your yeah, music yeah, for like ads, film and TV. You don't want to yeah, you know, what, what do you really want to do as a writer um, and or artist? And then, you know, we would talk about that and kind of move on from there. But it definitely helps to have somebody come to us and say, this is really worth checking out because it does legitimize it a little bit more. Otherwise, um, it's hard because there would be so many, so many submissions. Yeah, and... yeah, they just sort through, and then it'd be like a stack of resume, you know, two hundred, three hundred. Yeah, resumes. and yeah. not everyone would send you music that you would have like people who are clueless would be sending you music mm -hmm. that's like horrible recording or just not like up to a, a certain quality. So it just seems sure. like step one is uh, hustle your own network. You know, if you're an independent artist, to find a manager or a lawyer or someone with uh, repute. Uh, or right. report, excuse me. I don't even know what that word was. <laughs> I think someone they both work, report. actually. <laughs> report. Report. Yeah. Okay. Someone who has clout, whatever, uh, within <laughs> within the music industry uh, um, and can legitimately come up to a licensing company and have and like have that uh, mutual respect, like, oh, we respect you because you've done all this work, and just have them pitch uh, pitch your music. Uh, because, Definitely. Uh, if, they, if they don't believe, if, if one person doesn't believe in your music, then a whole – licensing company isn't isn't necessarily gonna right i mean and the flip side of that is that we do we do kind of blindly reach out to people that we stumble upon uh, you know on yeah. the internet or whatever yeah. or maybe a friend says check this out they're really great and so i think the flip side there is that you need to make sure that you have a great online presence oh, you know yeah. Yeah. um you, you need could to make you sure repeat that, that. Could you <laughs> yeah repeat that, could you repeat that very statement yeah um, you need to have a great online presence um which you means... need to have which means you need to have a facebook page okay. um at least you need to have um you know a band camp or something similar where we can check out at least some of your music and then there needs to be a way to contact you mm -hmm. on, on those sites mm -hmm. um you know if i nothing drives me more crazy than when i find a band that i think is awesome and i look all over the web and i can't find a contact any, form. Yeah, contact yeah, information. It's bad. so annoying, you know, like how am I going to get to you if there's not, you know, at least some sort of generic band email, you know, and then actually check that email for mm -hmm. sure. Um, that would be really important as well, yeah. <laughs> I think. you know, um, because that's also, that's also no good when somebody when somebody posts, you know, um, when you send a message to somebody and then time just passes and time just passes and then yeah. maybe we've already signed three bands and we no longer have a budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, hold on one Okay, second. no problem. <laughs> okay, Mally, uh, I know you get, you're getting phone calls in now, so I'm just going um, to wrap this up here uh, with one last cl uh, question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, there's one thing I want to mention before sure. I ask that question. Uh, I think what you're saying about having online presence is – is absolutely key whether you're trying to license music or not. Like if, if you are a musician in the modern era and you do not, and someone can't Google your name and find out everything they need to know about you, then 
you've got like a huge problem. So definitely working on that is, is super, super important. So Mallory, uh, last fun question of the interview. What is your favorite album and what would life be like if it never existed? <laughs> um, I'm guessing Bjork. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, um, I mean, it's really, I, I have a ton of favorite albums for sure. And anybody who is in the world of sync would probably say the same thing. Um, that's one of the reasons why we do it is to be able to work with so much music that we love. But I think since we have been talking about Bjork, um, I would say that one of my favorites is her album, Vespertine, and um, that's just one of those go-to albums that for me never gets old, has always sounded current and kind of ahead of its time simultaneously, and um, it, you know, it's something that I, I think I can return to time and time again to kind of remind me of why I'm in this industry in the first place, you know, <laughs> that I love music. Um, that I've had a chance to work with an artist like that who I loved and a lot of other great artists. And so if I didn't have that to listen to, um, I think, you know, I just wouldn't necessarily have that kind of touchstone reminder. Yeah. Um, and so the stressful days or the dark days yeah. would, <laughs> would, would be um, a, a bit more prevalent than they are yeah. now. Um, so yeah. I, I and, get through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, plus, I love sure. the fact that she writes by like walking through nature and singing to the mountains. I think that's epic. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, Definitely. Mallory. Thanks. Thanks so so much for coming on the show and sharing your vast music licensing knowledge. I mean, you've worked with like a lot of great artists, handled uh, music for you know radio Radiohead to like Gershwin, who's like has a huge catalog of great of great songs. A lot of that are standards. Um, so thanks again for coming on and sharing your knowledge. No problem. Thanks for having me. Okay, no problem. See you later. And that wraps up this week's episode of Seeds of Music. We had on the show Mallory Zumbach from Roundhill Music, which is a music licensing company. Make sure to check out the links below. And if you are thinking about licensing your music, just follow the tips that we had in this interview in order to best learn how to approach a company like Roundhill Music to get your music licensed. Because I'll tell you right now, music licensing is definitely uh, a viable option of income for yourself as an independent artist. Next, sign up to the email newsletter if you haven't yet. Uh, the Seeds of Music email newsletter is the best way to stay up to date with all the interviews and special email newsletter content. Also, subscribe to our podcast over at iTunes and leave a rating and a review. It's the best way uh, to hear an audio-only version and stay up to date with that. Also, and the rating and review part will help us rank higher in iTunes and also help me get bigger and better interviews and more years for this show. If you like this interview, make sure to like and share it. We have like and tweet buttons on the top and bottom and also a large share Facebook button uh, in the middle of this page. Lastly, comment on the video. What was your greatest revelation from this interview and how you apply what you've learned? Who would you like to see interviewed next? If that person is you, just send me an email to kyle.seedsmusic at gmail.com. At the most, it'll take me two days to get back to you, but rest assured, I answer every single email that comes my way. And remember, we are the future. Thank you.